Anyway, I had a, I was going to I was going to preach a message on the prophetic gift. And as Kathy and I were talking, we realized you can't just teach one time on the gift of prophecy and the prophetic gift. So I'm going to ask the pastors after they get ordained if Kathy and I maybe can come back sometime and we could do a seminar on spiritual gifts, including the pastoral gift. So um, we'll look forward to doing that in the future. But as I was praying, I, I, Kathy and I agreed on this. In fact, she said this and it, and it resonated with me at the same time. We have loved being here. We love you guys like we've known you for a long, long time. We love the way you've invited us in, you've accepted us, you've treated us like we're something special. Um, you may think we are, but we don't. We're just Jim and Kathy. Um, the special part is whatever God does in us that, that can be flowing out from us. And that's what we enjoy so much about ministry at this point in our lives. So anyway, um, as we were talking, I wanted to leave, uh, what's the word I want? I wanted to leave in an atmosphere of love. Um, here's a couple of questions I, I've asked, and I don't know if they're on the screen yet or not. Uh, two questions to help begin to focus us here. Who are we? And we as the church, how many people here are the church? Yeah, if you're born again, you're the church. Not the total church, but a portion of the church of Jesus Christ on the face of this earth. And God has called us out of darkness. Some of the, I, I really love the, the uh, worship music that we did this morning, the songs. They had such a tremendous uh, testimony to us and motivation to us about the love of Christ who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He's called us out of the kingdom of darkness into his glorious kingdom of light. So who are we as the church and what are we about what are we supposed to be about? And there's some scripture verses uh, that I'm going to uh, read. I, I have to get my glasses on. Remember Pastor Sean doing this and then doing this when he didn't need them anymore? So, um, God, the, I want to start by focusing on a scripture passage in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. It won't be on there. I'm just going to refer to it. But what it says is, Father God has adopted all born-again people as his own children into his family. When you accept Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, a bunch of things happen simultaneously. God removes your sin nature and gives you a new nature. He removes your past and gives you a new future. We don't live based on our past anymore in Christ. It's gone Whatever damage has happened to us because of our past, God begins the healing process of setting us free from those things. And uh, one of the first things that happens in the instantaneousness is that God adopts us out of the world into his family. That's what it says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5. You can turn to that later. In fact, if you've got a page, uh, uh, paper and pencil, write some of these things down, not because I think they're so important, but because I'd like you to read through them and pray through them yourself and see what the Lord says to you. But um, <clears throat> so Father God has adopted us into his own family. Um, and if he, in, in, the, in the book of Genesis, when God created Adam and Eve, he he ultimately referred to Adam as his son. And, and if Adam was his son, then Eve is his daughter. In the New Testament, the book of Rome, Romans, the Apostle Paul writes about the sonship, that we are in the place of son, not that son, but S-O-N, we're in the same place that Jesus was when he walked on this earth the human son of God. Now, we're never going to become deity. We're never going to become God. That's not happening. But we have a portion of the God nature in us. 
It's the spirit, the new spirit that God gives us when he removes the old. So what does this all mean to us? What does it mean to us? What does it mean in us? What has God called and planned for us to be and do? You know, we often talk about, God, show us what to do. God's more interested in showing us who we are. Not who we were in the past. That's gone. God doesn't see that anymore. He doesn't even look at that anymore. In fact, in the Old Testament, it says he put our sins as far as the east is from the west, and he chooses to remember them no more. God doesn't remember your sins anymore. Don't continually confess those old sins. And if you have a, if you have a feeling about them, say, Lord, I need some healing in this area. Set me free from the memory of those old things that Jesus paid for, that he died for, that his blood is washed away. And, and bring me into the understanding and the relationship of the newness of what you have put in me. And the fact that I stand in the place of authority as a son in your family. And you daughters, it, I've said this before, it's not about uh, male or female. It's about a place of position that God has brought us into in his family. And it's a, a position that he wants us to reveal to the world around us. Why would God want us to, be, to reveal our sonship? Anybody have any ideas about that? Why would God want us to, want us to reveal his sonship? To the world around us. Yeah, absolutely. If 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 people know you from your past, and I'm sure people do, and now they know you in the future, in the present, they're going to go, "Whoa, dude, what happened? You don't drink anymore. You don't shoot up anymore." You don't sniff up anymore. You're not cussing and swearing anymore like you used to. What's the problem, dude? Come on, let's go have a drink. No, that doesn't happen. Because they see something in you that they've never seen before. What is it? It's, it's the God thing that's in us. It's the Spirit of God who now lives in us. It's the Father God, the God who is love that now lives in us. It's Jesus, the Son, who now lives in us. That's kind of confusing to the mind. How can God, who created everything, live in us? <laughs> I don't know. When we get up there, we can ask him, Lord, how did that work? I don't get it. He goes, you weren't supposed to get it. You were just supposed to live in it. We're not going to get everything about God. I don't believe we'll ever get everything understanding about God. I don't believe we have that capacity. God didn't create us with the capacity to understand everything about him. He created with us with the capacity to love him and to receive his love so that we can love in, it, in truth. I love Real Life Church, the name Real Life Church. The Real Life Church is the, is the church who receives the love of God and allows that love to flow out from us to one another, but more importantly, to people around us that don't know God yet. We don't have to preach to people. We just love on them. Honor them. You know, you see the, the people on the side of the road, and we kind of look the other way. Maybe the Lord would want us to reach out and touch them. Just say hi. Um, our brother was talking about that before. Just say hi to someone. Ask them what's going on in their life. And then tell them, you know, the reason I stopped here is because I want you to know God loves you. He loves you more than you can understand. And he wants to be in your life. Sometimes that's all you have to say. Sometimes when you say something like that to, to people, you see tears. You'll see grown men cry. I, I didn't know that. I am so worthless. Well, you're not worthless to God. You're worth the life of his son, who he came to die for you. And he's got new life for you if you'll receive him. It, 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 you don't have to memorize a whole bunch of stuff. You don't have to memorize a whole lot of scripture. You need to know what you're saying. 
that it's scriptural, but you don't have to lay a whole bunch of Bible verses on people. Just lay the, the love of God on them. Allow the, the love of God, the agape love of God to flow through you just by recognizing somebody and letting them know God loves you. That does more than all the preaching in the world. And by the way, don't ever tell somebody like that they're a sinner. Oh, you're a sinner and you need to get saved or you're going to go to hell. Don't, don't lead with that. You know, they're hurting. They're in bad shape. They know they're a sinner, but they don't know what to do about it. To them, it's a hopeless thing. And, and one day I'll probably die and go to hell. You don't need to tell them that, but tell them God's plan for them. That God has already paid for the plan. All they have to do is receive it by faith. Amen. That's the gospel. And the gospel continues as, well, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let's look at John, uh, 1 John chapter 3, 1 through 3. And I'm going to be reading out of the Amplified Version and the Passion Translation. And, and I'm doing that, and I've checked back and forth between the NASV, and, and they're, they're good, okay? Um, anyway, John, uh, 1 John 3, 1 through 3. Is it up? Yes. Thanks, guys. Um, we're to be, one of the things that we're supposed to be is we're supposed to be like him. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. Verse 1 says, See that an incredible quality of love the Father has shown on us. Oh, I'm sorry. See what an incredible quality of love the Father has shown to us that we would be permitted to be named and called and counted as the children of God. And so we are. Say, I am a child of God. I stand in the place of sonship. God loves me more than I know. And I love him. He goes on and it says, for this reason, the world doesn't know us because it didn't know him. And I, I said, Lord, what? that's a funny verse between the other ones. What is that all about? And, and as, I, as I prayed and, and read and, and studied and so on, this is what I came up with. What he's saying here is they didn't accept me. They didn't love me. So if, if you're part of me, you're going to have that same, that same response in the world around you. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Jesus didn't worry about it. He loved people anyway. He goes on in, in verse 2 and says, Beloved, we are even here and now children of God, and it's not yet made clear what we will be after his coming. But we know that when he comes and is revealed, we will, as his children, be like him, because we will see him just as he is in all of his glory. Did you know that Jesus is going to share his glory with you? We talk about glorifying God. Our worship glorifies God. Our lives, are we're learning to glorify God by the way we live and by the things we do and the people we're around when we're with them. How do we glorify God when we're with people? Well, we love them. We give them what God has given to us. God's going to give us his glory. You can read in John chapter 17. He, when he's praying to the Father, he's praying, the glory you've given me, I've given to them. Did you know you have the glory of God? That's what the word says. And it's an increasing glory. It's a never-ending glory. Once we get it, it's going to get more and more and more. The more of God's glory or presence that we experience, the more we want. And the more we want it, the more we're going to get it. I seem to remember a song like that. Anyway, I'm not going to sing it. So... What, do, what, is, what are we supposed to be? What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be like him, his pure children. Okay, Hebrews chapter 12. So far, I think I'm doing pretty good because I'm staying on record here. Amen. Hebrews 12, 5 through 9, and this is out of the Passion Translation. It says, because he loves us, he will instruct us, train us, 
This is not what the scripture says. This is what I'm saying about it. I haven't gotten to the scripture yet. Because he loves us, he will instruct us. He'll train us. He'll give us his life-giving discipline. That doesn't mean punish by the, punishment, by the way. Discipline doesn't mean punishment. It means showing you how to do something better. Okay? Uh, through his life-giving discipline, now I've got to find where I am again, and correct, he'll correct us, meaning that he's leading us to the right path of life. God's correction isn't a whack. What'd you do that for? Don't do that. It's got nothing to do with it. God is, God's correction is, you see what this is in your life, and you're diff, it's difficult for you. Let's do it this way. I have a better way for you. So his dis discipline or his discipling and his correction bring us to a better place. They don't make us feel guilty. His instructions never make us feel guilty. His discipline never hurts us. And I know there's a place in this passage where it talks about even a father will, will physically spank his child to, if, if it's needed. That's not what it's talking about with us right here and now. He's not into spanking us. He's into increasing us. He's into advancing us. He's, even, he's, he's into taking the things out of our lives which are not good for us and giving us things that we will be blown away with. God only wants to give us good. That's his plan. To give us a better and better and better and better life. And as we walk with him, as we walk with the Holy Spirit, we move into that better and better. And we're leaving the things which have bound us in the past, which bother us now, and which tempt us to do the wrong stuff. We're walking away from that because of the greatness of the things that God is giving us and that he's putting in us. Also, we need to expect that God will discipline and correct us. Not to hurt us, but he's a loving discipliner, discipler. He's a loving corrector, and he only does it for our good. Sometimes religion tells us, well, God's going to smack us. Forget that. See, the, the devil didn't like that. God doesn't smack us. He graciously, lovingly, gently changes us if we allow him to do that. God never forces us. I can remember praying in times past, Holy Spirit, just take over my life and, 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 and force me into the right way. One day, one day in the back of my mind, I heard, I, I don't force people. I don't force people. I show people a better way, but it's up to them to choose that. How many here want to have a different life? How many want more freedom from, from bondages and, and weaknesses and all of that? Yeah. Well, in Christ, we have that freedom already, but we're growing into it. Somebody said, if, if you want to have a different life, you have to have different choices. If the choices you're making now are giving you the life you don't like, why do we keep doing that? Seems to me that's a, that's a definition of insanity. Doing the same thing all the time and expecting it to bring forth something new, it's not going to. So we have, that's why we have the Holy Spirit, by the way, and the Word of God. So that when we read the Word, especially the New Covenant Word, not exclusively, but in the New Covenant, we're shown the life of the kingdom that Jesus has brought us into. We've been brought into the kingdom of light, God's kingdom. By the way, the gospel that Jesus preached was, I am the king of the kingdom of God, and I will remove you from the kingdom of darkness and bring you into my kingdom if you'll give your life to me. That's the gospel. It's not, if you accept Jesus, you'll get saved. That's true. But the gospel of the kingdom is, you can be brought into the new kingdom. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of righteousness, the kingdom of joy, the kingdom of peace, the kingdom of power, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of blessing. It says in, in Ephesians that, that we have been given all 
of the, I'm messing it up here, all of the blessings that Christ has, we've been given those in him. When he comes into us, guess what he brings? All of his blessings. Everything God gave Jesus while he was on this earth, he's given us when Jesus comes into our lives, when we invite him in and trust him for our salvation. Okay. Um, verse 9 says this, And isn't it true that we respect our earthly fathers even though they corrected us and disciplined us? Then we should demonstrate an even greater respect for God, our spiritual father, as we submit to his life-giving discipline. I'm going to ask you a question. Don't raise your hands. How many of you are submitting to the life-giving discipline of God. You say, well, I'm trying. I, I try. I want. And those are all good things. Those are showing that there's, there's a progress going on in your life. And when we want the ways of God, guess what? That's what God wants us to want. So he's going to move us in that direction. Amen? Amen. Okay. We're going to turn to Romans 8. Look at verses 14 through 17. And this is what I'm saying about it before we read it. <clears throat> we have been given the Spirit of God to live in us, who also convinces us that we are the sons and daughters of God. How many of you really know deep down inside that you're a son and daughter of God? Okay, good. It's one thing to know it here. How many of you know it here? You've accepted Christ. You're a son or a daughter of God. Now, when we need to get it down here into our motivator, into our spiritual gut, if you will, into our spirit, and it needs to become our motivator. I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. Lord, how should I live? Like Jesus. He's our pattern. The way Jesus walked on the earth is the pattern that God wants us to walk in. You go, oh, I can't do that. Well, no, of course you can't do it on your own. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't live his life alone. He did it by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now, how do you know that, Jim? Because that's the pattern we're taught. If we're going to live like God, we have to do it by the motivation and the powering and the grace of God and the Holy Spirit. We can't do it on our own. We didn't get saved on our own. We got saved because of him and because we received what he did for us. We didn't do anything. We're just receiving it as our own and believing that when God says, if you come to me, I will not cast you out. If you come for salvation, I will save you. Lord, please save me. Come into my life. Change me. Give me your life. You think God's not going to answer a, a prayer like that? Duh, that's what he's been waiting for your whole life. <laughs> Why? Because he loves you and he wants to deliver you from the power of darkness and bring you in to the life, the glorious life of his kingdom where all of the blessings flow out of. The blessings flow from God out of his kingdom, into our lives, as we grow, as we progress, as we yield more and more to the Holy Spirit that's doing in our, the work that he's doing in our lives, which, by the way, is always founded in the word of God. Let me say this. This may shock you. Reading and in, 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 um, memorizing the word of God is not going to do you any good spiritually. I can hear it now. Now he's starting to preach heresy. Well, there's a lot of people that read the word of God and they're still unsaved. You know why? Because it's not the written word that's the word of God. This is only the representation of the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. He's the living word. And if we're going to get anything out of the Bible, we have to get it, out, get it from him who reveals the word to us. 
If it's not revealed, it's not powerful in our lives. You go, well, Jim, I, I could probably go crazy doing that and get off into left field. Yeah, you could. But you won't. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit is in you. And Jesus said he'll teach you all truth. And he will remind you of everything that I have taught. So if the Holy Spirit's living in us and we're relying on him to move us into the life that God has for us progressively, are we going to get off? Well, we might, but pretty soon we're going to go, whoa, this is the wrong place. I don't like that. And we'll step right back in. Now, let me say this. If you get off into sin, don't stay there. Don't wallow in that. Because the longer you stay, the more the devil is going to take advantage of you. <laughs> Don't let him do that. He doesn't have power over you unless you give it to him. The thoughts that he places in your mind, you have to choose to either reject or accept. You go, how do I know if it's a lie or not? Well, if you read the Bible, you'll know. Because the Bible teaches us what truth is. And the Spirit of God, when we're relying on Him to understand it, opens that truth up to us and empowers us to walk in it. How many have struggled with sin? You wanted to get out of it. You, didn't, you couldn't get out of it. Well, there's only a couple of us. Come on. We all struggle like that. But the Holy Spirit is in us. And when we say, Lord, I have this weakness. I can't, I can't conquer it. He says, of course you can. You don't need to. My son has already conquered it. And because you come to me with this weakness, I'm going to give you strength in that area, and you're going to walk away from it. It may take a day, maybe a couple of minutes. It may take a day, may take a week, may take a month, but you're going to walk away from it because you're asking God to strengthen you in this area so that it doesn't overpower you any longer. This is a progress, a progressive life we're living Romans, in Romans 8, it says, We've been given the Spirit of God to live in us. I know I read this already. Refreshing. And uh, to live in us, who also convinces us that we are the sons and daughters of God. And also, and how we can live like God's children, like Jesus showed us on earth. You know, why did Jesus live 33 years on this earth? Why didn't he just come as a man? And let the devil crucify him so that he could raise again, victorious over the devil, victorious over darkness, victorious over, over guilt, over shame, over all of that. Why didn't he just come and do that? Because God wanted us to see, wanted us to see what a person can be like if they're totally yielded to him. Jesus was the son of God. And the son of man. But he lived as the son of man. Rather than the son of God. He didn't stop being the son of God. He had two natures. His God nature. And a man nature. But his man nature was perfect. Sinless. Not marked. By sin and shame. Because he came to show us. What he wanted to give us. He wanted to give us. The original nature that he gave to Adam and Eve that was free from sin, was free from, from the weakness of, fallen, of a fallen nature. He wants to bring us back into the original creation as the sons and daughters of God who live pure, wonderful lives. That's the process we're in, all of us. Don't let guilt rule your life. Give it to Jesus. He took care of it on the cross. Guilt is a trap of Satan for born-again Christians. Um, let me go on. Okay, verses um, 14, 8, 14. Romans 8, 14. The mature children of God. How many here are mature? Boy, we're afraid to put our hand up for that, aren't we? <laughs> In Hebrews, we learned this last time the men got together. In Hebrews, how many are mature? Now it's tricky. Good, thank you. In Hebrews, it said, the, the people who eat strong meat 
they're speaking of maturity, are those who have lived long enough with God to discern right from wrong. How many are discerning right from wrong in your life? How many do that 100%? <laughs> it's a progress and a process. The more we yield to him, the stronger we get, the more of his presence is revealed in us and through us. The more we yield, the more we get. The more we yield, the more we get. The more we get, the more we, get, we can give. That's maturity. Oh, this is wrong. How do I know that's wrong? Because the Holy Spirit in me uses the word of God to show me that it's wrong. And at the same time, he's not making me feel guilty. He's showing me that I can be set free from that. That's God's discipline. It's a different pattern. Discipline sets a pattern. How many have gone to the, to the uh, um, weights, weights, you know, pushing weights, weightlifting, all of that? Yeah, I did that in years past, too. I, I need to get back to it because there's some things I need to get. Weight, it just changes things. But discipline, if you're going to build strong muscles, a strong body, you have to discipline yourself. You lift weights. You might run. You might do exercises. You change your diet. There's a discipline to receive the change you're looking for. Same thing with Christ. That's all he wants to do. He doesn't want to hammer us. He wants to set us free through a dis different way of living, a different discipline of life. Amen? Amen? The mature children are those who who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. How do you know what the impulses of the Holy Spirit are? Because usually they're different than the, the natural impulses you get, and they motivate you to go in a better place. Okay? The devil's never going to motivate you to go to a, dever, a better place unless he's using some sort of a, de, uh, a deceitful technique. Oh, I'll give you money. I'll give you fame. A better place, right? Yeah, right. I'll give you a nice car. Jim, I'll give you a beautiful motorcycle. Why? Because then you'll move further away from God so that I can get more on you. The devil's discipline is to lead us away from the light. God's discipline is to lead us away from the darkness. The devil's discipline is to come into our lives and become the strength that motivates us to go to the wrong places. God's discipline is, I've come into your life and I'm showing you the better way. The way that I plan for you to live in eternity past. The only way you're going to come in to real fulfillment in your life. Real joy in your life. Real happiness in your life. You're not going to get it on your own. We get it by following the way of God, the way the Holy Spirit and the Word of God show us. Amen? And it doesn't happen just because we're going to tough it out. You know, you don't pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You can do that, but that's only physical. Spiritually, you don't do it. The Holy Spirit does it as we yield to Him, as we submit to His ways rather than the ways that have brought us into some sort of bondage. Amen? Verse 15, and you did not receive the spirit of religious duty leading you back into the fear of never being good enough. How many are tempted to believe you're not good enough? We're all tempted to that. But when we begin to feel, oh, I'm just not good enough, Holy Spirit goes, are you serious? Jesus died for you because he counted you good enough. Doesn't get any better than that. We just have to remember that here. And here, I don't feel like I'm good enough, but God says I am. Say this, God loves me best. And it's true for everybody. God loves me best. He doesn't love you any more than he loves me. He doesn't love me any more than he loves you. And guess what? He doesn't love us any more than he loves the lost. He died for us all. We've come into that. We become part of family. We receive family love. People have not yet come in, receive God's love that brings them into the light, that brings them into the family. Amen? Amen. 
don't shout me down just because I'm preaching. No, no. <laughs> He goes on and he says, but you have received the, the spirit of full acceptance. In, I love this, the way that the translator put this. Enfolding you into the family of God. If Jesus is your Savior, you've been enfolded into God's family. We're partakers, Peter, I believe it was Peter who wrote this, partakers of the divine nature. We're not becoming God, but we partake of his nature. He has come into us. His nature it lives in us, and we draw out of his nature to change our nature. And the Holy Spirit shows us how to do that. Was that a confusing statement? Kathy says it was. And, and it can be. But the fact remains is, the nature of God is in us. How come? Because our human nature, our saved human nature needs his strength, needs his guidance, needs his place in our lives. Okay, verse 16. Oh, at, at, at the end of 15, it says, And you will never feel orphaned. For as he raises us up with us, our spirits join him in saying the words of tender affection, beloved father. In, in the uh, other translations, it says, the spirit of God living in us causes us to cry out, Abba, father. Well, in English, rather than Hebrew, Abba, in Hebrew, it says, love, it means loving father. Now that says more to me than the word Abba. I don't know what Abba means and all of its, its uh, nuances in the, in the Hebrew. In fact, we were in Jerusalem um, years ago. We went on a tour, and um, we were there when Desert Storm broke out. And at one night, the, the fire alarms, the, uh, the alarms rang, and we were all to go up to the eighth floor of the, the uh, hotel, put on gas masks, tape off the windows and the doors and all of that, and sit there and wait to see if a bomb, because they were, they were flying scuds over, and they, were, they suspected that they were putting nerve gas in them. So they set us up for this. So we're sitting there, and, and before we got into our rooms, our pastor's wife was freaking out. She was going into hysterics. And we had met a rabbi from New York City. I believe it was um, his name was Eckelman. He had brought high school students from their, from their school over to Jerusalem for part of their training in the Hebrew life. And he met us in the hall and he says, well, we had met him in the elevator and we introduced ourselves and and he says, oh, oh, you're the charismatic people that are here. Wow, that's wonderful. He said, I'm, I'm Abby. I forget what his first name was. But anyway, Abby is daddy. And that's what, you know, it's like saying I'm Pastor Jim. Only I don't say I'm Pastor Jim. My name is Jim and I'm a pastor. Because my name isn't Pastor. Your name isn't Carpenter. George. You know, whatever. Get the point. Anyway. So here we have this man named Abby Eckelman. And I didn't realize it at first. I said, well, hello, Abby. And, I, and I'm realizing later on, that's Abba. It's the familiar form of Abba. But I didn't understand it. If he, if he had said, I'm beloved, Eckelman, that might have been and made a little more sense. Well, that's what this is saying. The Holy Spirit is in us, causing us to cry out, Beloved father, loving daddy, if you will. When you're praying to God, call him daddy and see what happens. You go, are you serious? Yeah, he's your daddy. He loves you more than your father ever could. He loves you more than you can love your kids. He's your daddy. He doesn't do bad in your life. He doesn't allow bad in your life. You go, well, I don't know about that one, Jim. Our pastor just died. That wasn't God doing that. I don't want to go too far with that. But it's a struggle you're going to have, the, the, the mind struggle. You're going to have that for a while. Don't allow that to bring doubt into your life. 
okay? We don't have all the answers about why Sean died. I wish we did, but we don't. But God still has a plan for us. He still has a plan for this church. And based on, if you will, the cutoff tree that Sean is and the stump that's left, as God breathes the scent of water onto that, it begins to grow again and again and again. That's the picture I got out of that. And I know that people, the Lord will give other people nuances of understanding of that. That's where we are right now. We're standing on Sean's vision, and God is going to give us new understanding, new ways, because Sean is not here to carry his ways that God has put in him, but we are. And God's going to show us our ways of building on that foundation which Sean laid. We don't have to understand it all. We just have to say, Lord, what's my part? How do I get to the place you want me to be in this congregation so that we together can do the things you want us to do in this world around us? Verse 16 says, For the Spirit, for the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as he whispers into our innermost being, you are God's beloved. Turn to uh, John 14, 12 through 15 if you want to. This is what I've gotten out of it. We will do his works and greater works by the Holy Spirit. And, and when I was um, early on, I preached out of this. Um, Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, if you love me, if you keep my commandments, the works that I've done, you will do, and greater works. I'm not going to read the passage because we've read it before, but that's what it's saying. I love the way the, inter the uh, translator of the Passion translated that last one. It says, um, loving me empowers you to obey my commandments. There's more to that statement than the English can put in from the Hebrew and the Greek. If you love me, keep my commandments. What its, what its true intent is that loving me enables you to keep my commandments. Not the other way around. Keeping commandments will never cause us to love God but it will lock us up in religion. Anybody ever been there? Yeah. If you've been in any church that doesn't honor the name of Jesus, you've been locked up in religion. Anyway, um, I'm not going to be naming religions either. At this point, after I got through writing all of this and studying through all of this, I thought, man... I need to find out where I am in this, Lord. Where am I in the process of this? This is after 50-some years of being a pastor. So I, I, I want to I make a statement before I go through this. These statements are not, these questions are not, I, I'm not giving them so that we'll feel ashamed or that we feel ju judged by anything going on in our lives right now. There's no shame. There's no judgment. There's no condemnation for us in Christ. It says that in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. That don't let anybody condemn you. Don't let anybody try to shame you. And don't let anybody flick your ear either. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I'm not wanting to make anyone feel shamed or judged by these questions. My only purpose is to help us understand where we are in the process of becoming all that Holy Spirit desires to do in us so that he can move more effectively through us to bring us into the fullness of the life that God has placed in us. The fullness of the God life is in us, and we're learning to move into it, to grow into it, to receive it, to submit into it. You don't get it unless you submit to it. You know, 
If you've got $5 billion in the bank, you don't get any of it until you go to the bank and submit that it's yours and get some out. That's where we're at. We've been given a billion dollar life. It's in us, but we have to learn to draw on it. How, what's the password to the account? How much can I take out at a time? Can I get all billion? No. You have to grow into the responsibility of that. You have to grow into the fullness of that. You have to grow into the power of that. And growing into power needs that you've dealt with your weaknesses. And how do I deal with my weaknesses? By submitting to the work and the impressions of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Oh, I didn't know that was wrong, but now I see it. I have this weakness because I've been lied to about this wrong philosophy or this wrong way of living that I've grown into. Lord, help me to get rid of this garbage. I almost used the SH word, but I, I won't do that. So here's some questions. Lord, am I progressing into my place as a son or daughter of yours? Yeah. If you're growing, if you can look back at last year and see, remember who you were and see who you are now, you're in that process. Amen? The question is, are you fighting against it or are you yielding into it? That's going to be the question forever. Well, in this life. The second question, am I doing what sons and daughters are called and empowered to do? Well, how would I know that? By reading the word, by reading the teaching of Jesus, by reading the teaching of the apostles. Everything they taught was to show us how to move into the life that God has given for us. Amen? Or given to us. Number four, am I encouraging or hindering people around me to become saved and to become disciples being discipled into God's family? And into his kingdom. Am I a motivator for good? Or am I hindering people? The Holy Spirit will show you. If you ask these questions. He'll show you the answers. And he'll show you the way out. Another question is. And this is my last question. Am I actively and purposefully. Pressing into. Pressing into. It's my purpose to become all that God says I am. That's purpose. Pressing into all that God has for me to be. And based on that, what he wants me to do. Don't try to do things before you know who you are and what authority you have to do those things. You know, in the world, we can bluff it. <laughs> we can do that a lot. We, we sign up for a job. We make out our, our, uh, our um, thank you, our resume, and we fudge it a little bit. We add a little bit more than what's real. And then we get the job, and what happens? <laughs> you said you could do that. You lied to me. You're out of here. So are we purposefully pushing into everything God wants us to be. We're not human doers. We're human beings. First, we have to be who God says we are in the reality of the way we live so that we then can do the things that God has asked us to do or said we could do. Um, there are over 1,500 pastors a week who leave the ministry. You go, well, wh why do they do that? Maybe because they had bad churches. No. I believe it's because they didn't know that God had not made them pastors. We need to know who God says we are. What's God's plan for your life? Does he want you to be a pastor? Does he want you to be a teacher, an apostle, a prophet, evangelist? Or does he want you to be a carpenter? 
Does he want you to be a, a professional painter? Does he want you to be a, a maintenance man? Does he want you in government? What is God, God's plan for you? Lord, I need to know my plan so that I can do it. Well, first you need to let me do the work in you that prepares you to have the ability to move in what I've called you to be. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens through discipline, through submission, through discipline, which brings change, which brings an opening of understanding. Oh, God put that portion of that in me. Okay, Lord, how do I move into that? Well, son, well, daughter, you've got to let this go. You've got, maybe you've got to deal with unforgiveness. Or, or maybe you've got things going on in your mind that run on and on and on. You've got to deal with that. Lord, how do I get these pictures out of my mind? That was my big thing after using pornography most of my teen years. God, how do I get these pictures out of my mind? And the Lord began to show me. At one point, he said, rebuke it in my name and tell it to get away, and it will go. I was leading worship in our church in Alaska. I was the worship leader. Don't ask me why. I don't play anything. But I would be leading worship, and in between songs sometimes, we would just stop and worship the Lord. And sometimes people would be worshiping in tongues, and sometimes people would be saying hallelujah, stuff like that. We were, we were staying there that day, and all of a sudden, this, this movie the pornographic movie flushed into my mind. I went, oh, God, how can I get rid of that? Later on, the Lord said, rebuke it. Go right back into worship. Don't let it do anything in your life. So I went through a process. Every time the pictures came, I rebuked it in Jesus' name, told it to get away. And it doesn't come back. It didn't take long, but the Lord showed me the discipline to deal with it. It was a discipline. Did it hurt? No, it set me free. I was released and relieved. I don't have to deal with that anymore. And by the way, if it tries to come back, I'm like, are you serious? Get out of here. That's washed in the blood. It's gone. Don't even try to come back. Amen. Any questions? I love questions. Has any of this made sense to you? Good. Appreciate that. You guys are fantastic. We love you. We're so glad we've been able to spend time with you these last month or a couple of months, actually. And we look forward to the next time we come back. If anybody would like prayer, we would count it a, a distinct privilege to be able to pray with you about anything. So let's stand for prayer. Lord, your love is absolutely phenomenal. We don't really understand it, but we're so glad that you love us the way you do. That you don't hold things against us. And that you only want to bring us out of the weaknesses of our life into the strength and the fullness of your life. That you want to separate us from the sinful things we find ourselves doing in life so that we can be pure unto you because we love you, Lord. We want to be like you. We want to move into your purity, your righteousness, your joy. Help us, Lord. Help us. Lord, I ask that you would touch each one of us here this morning, that you would reveal your great love to us and the fact that you've got all the strength we need to deal with all the weakness we have. Lord, I thank you for this congregation. I thank you for the stand that it's taken and for the walk that each person is on. And I ask, Lord, that you, would, that you would reveal to each person the change that you desire for them so that they can move into the fullness of life that you've planned for them. Not to make them feel guilty in any way. Not to make them feel less in any way. But to show them how they can walk into the greatness that you've said they are. I thank you for their commitment, for each person's commitment, for their love for one another, for their support for one another. And Father, as, as you bring uh, Rebecca back this week, we ask that that would be a glad reunion and that Rebecca would feel totally, completely received 
and that as she feels that, she'll give love. Lord, I, I'm just, yeah, okay. Thank you, Lord. 